The glory days of Solomon's reign are not primarily a testimony to the greatness of Solomon. They are foundationally a testimony to the kindness and to the faithfulness of God, the undeserved generosity of the God who makes promises and keeps promises to a very thoroughly unworthy people. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller. Glad you've joined us today as we continue our series in the book of 1 Kings. It's called Days of Glory. And uh, Jonathan, as we've begun to look at the life of Solomon, you point out that Solomon's riches, his wisdom, all that he experienced actually point to promises of God. Why is that? Well, I think in these glory days of Solomon's reign, and they were wonderful days on many levels that we see here, recounted for us in First Kings in these early chapters. In, in this picture of a, of a good kingdom and a good reign, we are actually being pointed forward to what it will look like in some measure to live under the rule and reign of the Lord Jesus Christ in his eternal kingdom. And that is a hopeful picture. That is, that is a picture that is meant to inspire joy and trust and anticipation for the people of God. And I would say as well, for those who are aware of the chaos of our world, of the frailty of human leaders in different places where we live around the world, we're aware of the fragility of our systems and structures. If, if, if you're in that place and you're feeling that acutely today, as, as many will be, this is an invitation to come under the rule and the reign of the king who is perfect and wise and generous and good. This is an invitation to come under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. Well, it's going to be a great time together as we open up our Bibles to the book of 1 Kings. We're in chapters 3 and 4 today as we begin a message called, A Blessed King, A Blessed People. Here is Jonathan. Thus far in 1 Kings, the kingdom has survived a succession battle and has been transferred from David to God's appointed successor to his son Solomon. And as we left the narrative last time, we read these very, very reassuring words at the end of chapter 2. You may remember, so the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. The promises of God to David, which we considered last time, they give us reason for optimistic anticipation of what's going to come next. The son of David was going to build a house for God, and the Lord himself would establish his kingdom. We sense that these are going to be good days. As we look back on the history of the Old Testament, as we survey that history, we have to conclude that these next chapters in 1 Kings, these central days of the reign of great King Solomon, they will go down in history as the high water mark of the kingdom's history. These truly are the glory days of the Old Testament era. Never before and never since would the kingdom be so large, so prosperous, so peaceful, so happy, so influential as it is under Solomon. And so within these verses and within these chapters, we are given a picture of the kingdom functioning well. We're given a picture of a king who sits under the blessing of God, who brings the blessing of God in turn to his people. And in this picture of a blessed kingdom, we have a prophetic depiction, a foretaste of what it will look like to live in God's glorious kingdom in all eternity to come. So what do we learn together here about the kingdom of blessing, the kingdom of glory? What are its characteristics? Well, first we see that the blessed kingdom is grounded in grace. That's our first lesson. Things are going very well indeed for Israel in these days. Solomon himself is doing well. He walks with the Lord. He loves the Lord as we read here. He seeks wisdom. He uses that wisdom to govern well. And we might skim through these chapters together and essentially conclude that things are going well for Israel. Israel is being blessed simply because Solomon is a rather good chap. Solomon is a good king. He's doing right, and so things are 
going right. Or, or we might be a little more circumspect and a little bit more theological in our assessment, and we might say that he is doing right, and so God is pleased and is choosing in favor to bless him. And, and in a sense, of course, that is true insofar as it goes. But as we enter into this season of extraordinary blessing in the life of Israel, what eclipses any merit of Solomon or any initiative of Solomon in his reign, what eclipses it all is the overarching grace and goodness of God. And the narrative, it highlights that for us right at the start of the chapter and right on through. I remember an older Christian saying in my hearing when I was a young person, a teenager, it sort of stuck in my mind. I remember him saying that if you don't see or notice any flaws in a person, it's because you don't know them well enough. Get to know them and you're going to see their weaknesses, you're going to see their sins. And the comment, it, it struck me, it kind of lodged in my memory. It sounds somewhat cynical, of course, but at the same time, it's really quite true. I think we know that. From, from a distance, we might look on Solomon at this point and think of him as a spiritual hero, a giant of the faith. We read the book of Proverbs, and we see his remarkable wisdom, and it really is remarkable wisdom, the wisdom that God was pleased to give him. We see the great temple that he builds, and we marvel at his wealth, his ingenuity, his leadership. But First Kings doesn't actually start there. It starts with a rather more sober and realistic portrait of who he was and what he was like, warts and all. Notice with me again how chapter 3 opens. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house in the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were sacrificing at the high places, however, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord. Once his kingdom is established, the very first thing that Solomon does is to establish an alliance with Egypt, and to do so through marriage, which was not uncommon. Now, we don't have to be Old Testament scholars or experts in Old Testament history to know that Egypt is more or less the arch enemy of Israel in Scripture. The Israelites were in bondage, in slavery in Egypt for a long period of time. Their liberation from Egypt was really what constituted the nation as an independent, a free nation. Egypt is the place of bondage, of oppression, of darkness, and the whole history of Israel as a kingdom is set against that rather dark background. But now Solomon, in his first act recorded for us as an established king with his kingdom settled, the first act he pursues in peace is an alliance with Egypt, and he goes further. He marries the daughter of Pharaoh. Now, we know that Israelites were to be set apart from the nations as holy to the Lord. Intermarrying with the surrounding nations is never encouraged. It always leads to spiritual compromise, always leads to a divided loyalty of heart. This will actually be Solomon's downfall in the end if we know where the story is going. Now, on one level, we might say, you know, that an alliance with Egypt is a sign of Israel having entered the world stage as a real player on the platform. It's the, sort of the ancient equivalent of joining the G7 or something like that. This is a sign of blessing. Some commentators certainly read it that way, and no doubt this is a mark of Solomon's increasing prominence and Israel's increasing prominence on the world stage. But it is actually more than that at a more foundational level. It is a warning sign of things to come. It's a signal that all is not well with Solomon. And another concerning spiritual sign is hot on the heels of this. Solomon's worship is disordered. The people of God are meant to worship God at only one place and in only one 
way. The place of his appointing has been set. The Lord's been very clear about that before now in the book of Deuteronomy. But in Solomon's day, the people were worshiping at shrines in different places, high places as they're called, much like the surrounding nations worshipped at different places, high places. This was going on in the early days of Solomon's kingdom. Verse 2, and worse, Solomon himself was an enthusiastic participant in the worship at the high places. Verse 3, Solomon loved the Lord, and that's good, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer not just one or two sacrifices occasionally. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, this is a big deal. He offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. That's a lot of burnt offerings. At the end of his life, Solomon will turn to idolatry in a full-throttled kind of a way, and he will build high places for false gods, for idols. It turns to absolute disaster, but the seeds of the trouble are right here from the beginning. It's recorded for us to read. It's plain for the Lord to see, and when we pause and consider all this in the cold light of day, we might as well ask the question, why does the Lord continue to bother with Solomon? You know, this king, he actually didn't turn out, it looked good a little bit, but there were promising signs. But actually, why not just move on to the next king? But no, the, the Lord has decided he's going to use Solomon, not because Solomon is flawless, faultless, or wonderful, but because he is a God of grace. And what comes next in the narrative is truly stunning, considering what we've observed thus far. Verse 5, at one of these high places, at the wrong place for worship, at Gibeon, where, where Solomon is actually worshiping in a disordered way, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I shall give you. What a question. I mean, imagine the Lord coming along and asking that question. The Lord God of heaven and earth, the sovereign of the universe, appears to Solomon, this man who's compromised himself with marriage to a foreigner, with an unbeliever, we take it, who is worshiping God at the wrong place and in the wrong way, who loves the Lord, but is a complex and compromised character. And yet the Lord says to him, more or less out of the blue, ask what I shall give you. We'll come to Solomon's request in just a moment. But doesn't the Lord's approach teach us something really quite profound here? Doesn't it highlight something of really truly weighty significance about the Lord God himself? Doesn't it tell us that this is a story above all things and before all things of the undeserved, unmerited grace and kindness of God? You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called A Blessed King, A Blessed People. We're taking a look at 1 Kings chapters 3 and 4 today, and we'll get back to the message in just a moment. If you ever miss a broadcast, you can always come and listen online. Our website is EncounterTheTruth.org, and you can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. Another way to stay connected with Jonathan's teaching is through the Encounter the Truth app, and you're going to find that at your favorite app store. If you don't have that, I hope you'll go get it. It's free, and it's a great way to make sure that you're not missing Jonathan's teaching each and every day. But whether you listen to this program on the radio or through the app, it's made possible through your generosity. So thank you for giving and supporting this ministry. If you want to find out more about how you can support Encounter the Truth or give a gift right now, come to our website, EncounterTheTruth.org, or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884. Well, let's get back to the message. Here is Jonathan. I think if we look at Solomon in this moment, we do find ourselves looking into something of a mirror. That's how I feel anyway. At, at least in some respects, and to some extent. Here's a man who is complex and conflicted, compromised in some ways. He loves the Lord. Yes, that's good. Verse 3 and yet his life is untidy. There is messiness. There is sin. And in the midst of all that messiness, in the midst of all that sin, 
the Lord shows him such grace, such kindness, such generosity, and it just, it just gives people like us hope, doesn't it? It warms my heart. It tells us that the Lord is not quick to write people off, not quick to reject. Solomon isn't going to repent fully of this. And what we'll see is that he actually goes deeper into compromise, deeper into sin, and he will be a profound warning to us. But the Lord's grace is so overwhelmingly wonderful, wide and deep, generous and free. It is the foundation of everything here. And actually, as we examine the chapter carefully, we see that this grace is not a random or a, a haphazard thing. It is firmly grounded in the covenant promises of God. Promises that go back to David. Promises actually that go right back to Abraham. You'll remember that in 2 Samuel 7, God made a great promise to David that he would place a son of his on the throne, that this son would build a house for David and a house for the Lord, and the Lord himself would view this son of David as a son of his own and would establish his kingdom. Now, what we see here in this chapter is that God is coming through on his promise. He's proving himself good to his word. And so what we're seeing here is not a triumph of the goodness and greatness of Solomon. No, we are seeing a triumph of the goodness and greatness and the sheer faithfulness of God. That's what's being showcased here. But going further back beyond David at the establishment of the Israelite family, God promised to Abraham, you remember, that he would make of him a nation that would be as numerous, do you remember, as the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore, and he further promised to him a great territory. Genesis 15 and verse 18, this is what he says, to your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Now it was Genesis 15. Now look at what we discover here in 1 Kings in the days of Solomon, in the days of blessing, in the days of covenant fulfillment. 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 20, notice it with me, echoing words God spoke first to Abraham. Chapter 4 and verse 20, Judah and Israel were as many as the sand by the sea. They ate and drank and were happy. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. You hear the echoes. You see the fulfillment. The glory days of Solomon's reign are not primarily a testimony to the greatness of Solomon, great as he was. They are primarily and foundationally a testimony to the kindness and to the faithfulness of God, the undeserved generosity of the God who makes promises and keeps promises to a very thoroughly unworthy people. The glittering kingdom of Solomon, the picture here of prosperity and bliss, it is but a faint and a shadowy foretaste of the kingdom that is to come, of the bliss that the people of God will enjoy living in his presence in the world that is to come. And the kingdom of blessing, the eternal kingdom of God, it's not a place that is won for any of us in and through our own merits. It is not any kind of a reward for human greatness. It is a gift of God. It is something that God gives to an undeserving people. It is a promise that God makes to a people who have no claim upon his promises. The doors of the kingdom are flung open to you and to me only because God has opened them to us in his grace. And he's done that by giving his son to pay the price of our entry. God wasn't naive about Solomon, and he's not naive about you. He's not naive about me. God wasn't naive about Solomon when he offered him such generosity. And he's not naive about us as he offers us the gift of his son and entrance to the kingdom. The fact of the matter is, the bottom line is this, God is simply generous and God is simply gracious. And his son has shed his blood that we might be cleansed and forgiven, made fit for the kingdom as we trust in him. The blessed kingdom, it's grounded in grace. Next, the blessed kingdom is governed by wisdom. 
I don't know what you would ask for if you had the invitation to ask God for anything. If he appeared to you as he appeared to Solomon and extended that extraordinary invitation, I mean, the mind just begins to spin a little thinking what one might, might ask for. I take it that we might be tempted, each one of us, to go in a slightly more self-indulgent direction than Solomon went in his great request. Very often a great leader, a monarch, a politician, will have a moment of greatness for which he or she will be remembered in particular. They may have their faults, they may end in disgrace, but there will be the high water mark, the moment of brilliance, Churchill's World War II, and so on. And this, this is really uh, Solomon's great moment. Here is the core of his reply to the Lord's invitation, verse 7. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or to come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people that I may discern between good and good and evil, for who is able to govern this, your great people? I saw recently in the news, you may have seen this, that the founder of Amazon, who currently ranks as the world's third richest man, has commissioned the building of the world's largest super yacht at a cost of $485 million. This has caused some consternation in the Dutch city of Rotterdam because a historic bridge will need to be temporarily removed to allow the ship to travel through the city from the shipyard to the open sea. And I just thought to myself as I, I read that, so that is what you buy when you can buy yourself literally anything that your little heart desires. <laughs> That's the great prize for the super-duper extraordinarily rich these days. Solomon could have asked for anything, but he asked for this, wisdom that he might govern well. And, you know, he got the privilege of divine approval for his request. I mean, he really hit the nail on the head here. Verse 10, it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, because you've asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. The Lord gave to Solomon all that he asked for, and so much more. But at the core, he gave to Solomon this gift of wisdom. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth, a blessed king, a blessed people. And we're going to pause right here, but we'll continue this message on our next broadcast. So I hope you make it a point to tune in. Of course, you can be listening to Jonathan's teaching each day on the radio. But if you can't be listening for some reason, you can listen online. Our website is EncounterTheTruth.org, and you can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. You can also listen through the Encounter the Truth app, which you're going to find at your favorite app store or we can link you to it through our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Encounter the Truth is able to be on this station because of your generosity. It is your giving that allows Jonathan's teaching to stay here each and every day. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you a book written by Tim Keller. It's called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. And uh, Jonathan, identity is something that is talked a lot about in culture today. And it sounds like this is a book that's actually going to address our identity. I think it does in a very profound way because it ties issues of identity to the person and work of Jesus Christ. And of course, for the Christian believer, our identity is bound up with Jesus and his saving work at Calvary. But so many people struggle with issues of identity and of self-esteem, perhaps struggling to find a sense of self-worth. And it may be that you or a friend are struggling through those issues just now. And, and if that's the case, we would love to offer you this resource. Tim Keller very helpfully points us to the person of Jesus Christ and to his saving work and shows us how we can be liberated to enjoy freedom in Christ as we forget ourselves. We don't, we don't see ourselves through the lens of our success or our failures, but we see ourselves through the lens of Jesus and his work at Calvary. And I think it'll be a tremendous encouragement to you and to others in your life. 
Well, the name of the book is The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. It's the path of true Christian joy. Again, it's our gift to you. As you give a financial gift of any amount to Encounter the Truth this month, you can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884 or EncounterTheTruth.org. For Jonathan, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.